Well, I had originally intended to cover the visitor pattern in this video, but as I began working on it, I realized that a lot of its perceived complexity comes from the concept of double dispatch, which honestly is fascinating enough that it deserves its own video. So for today, we're going to walk through double dispatch. We're going to see how it's been traditionally solved for in single dispatch languages. And then we'll look at the tools that Kotlin gives us to solve the same problem with more concise code. And then in the next video, we'll be in a much better place to approach the visitor pattern. So let's get started. I've noticed that different kinds of dogs react to different kinds of people in different ways. So for example, our schnauzer will bark ferociously at the mailman, but when it's time for her haircut, she will run and hide from the groomer. And if you compare that to, say, an Australian shepherd who might just watch the mailman cautiously and might roll over when it's time for his haircut. And then you've got golden retrievers who basically just love everyone and is going to wag his tail no matter who it is. So to model these interactions, I've got three subtypes of dog. I've got a schnauzer, an Aussie, and a golden. And down here, we've got three subtypes of a person, including a class for mailman, a class for a groomer, and an object for Santa, because there's only one Santa Claus. Don't believe those guys at the mall. Now, in our main function, we've got a list of dogs and the list of people. And then down here, we just loop over all of them to see how the interaction goes for each combination of dog and person. Now, unfortunately, when we run this code, we end up seeing that the result is that the default implementation of React2 is called in every case except for the golden retriever. So why aren't any of these functions here getting called? Well, first, let's talk about this function call down here, this dog.react2person. Now, we've got eight different functions that are named React2. You can see them up here. So the question is this. When we call a function named React2, how does Kotlin decide which of those eight implementations it should use? And that decision about which function to invoke is called dispatch. Now, keep in mind that down here on this line, both dog and person are abstract types. So the type of dog is just dog, and the type of person is just person. So when our code is running, dog might actually be a golden, and person might actually be a mailman. But as far as the compiler knows, on this line here, we've only got a dog and a person type. Well, like a lot of languages that support object-oriented programming, Kotlin will dispatch based on the runtime type of the receiver. Now, when I say receiver, I just mean the object that's on the left side of the dot here. And when I say runtime type, I mean its actual type when we instantiated it. So not dog, but schnauzer, Aussie, or golden. So again, Kotlin will dispatch based on the runtime type of the receiver. So for example, if the runtime type is golden, then when we call react to, Kotlin will dispatch to this function here. But even though Kotlin's dispatch uses the runtime type of the receiver, it only uses the compile time type of its regular argument. So in other words, for the purposes of dispatch, the actual type of the person, whether it's a mailman, a groomer, or even Santa, is completely irrelevant. Only the declared type matters, and that type here is person. And that's why none of these functions are invoked, because the declared type is only ever person. So it works for the golden retriever class because the parameter type is person. But for Schnauzer and Aussie, none of these functions have a parameter type of person. They're using more specific types. So instead, the default implementation in its supertype is invoked. Now, when a language dispatches based on the actual runtime type of the receiver and the actual runtime type of its arguments, it supports a feature called multiple dispatch. And in the case where we've got one receiver and one regular argument, that's two types, so it's called double dispatch. Well, if we want to get the effect of double dispatch in a single dispatch language like Kotlin, we're going to need a little ingenuity. There are a few languages out there that support multiple dispatch, like Julia, for example, but many of the most common languages only support single dispatch. However, we can get the effects of double dispatch by flipping things around a little bit. So let's see how that looks. So let's introduce a new function in our person type 
named meet. And then inside each subtype of person, we simply call into the dog.react to function. And then next, instead of a react to function that works on any kind of a person, we'll make an overload for each kind of person. And then we'll make sure that we override each one in the subclasses here. And then to make things easier for the golden retriever class, we'll mark the existing function as private and give it a new name so that we can just delegate to that for each of its overloads. And then finally, we can change our call down here so that instead of dog.react2, you can see we're getting a compiler error there now, uh, we're just going to call person.meet. And now when we run this, we'll get the output that we expect where each dog prints out its own unique greeting for each kind of person. Now, if you're like Mr. Grumpy Recalcitrant Man, you might be saying, Dave, why we got to zigzaggy dem function calls. Well, it does kind of seem like we're just bouncing back and forth when we call person.meet down here, and then each one in turn simply calls dog.react to this. So why couldn't we just inline these function calls inside of our loop? Well, the reason is that this extra indirection is what allows our function to be selected based on the runtime type of both the receiver and the regular function argument. Why is that? Well, as I said earlier, the runtime type only matters for the receiver. So first, we make person the receiver here, which allows its dispatch to be chosen based on the runtime type of person. And then we make dog the receiver here, which allows its dispatch to be chosen based on the runtime type of dog. So by flip-flopping these, we're giving each one a turn as the receiver. And that is what simulates double dispatch in our code here. Note that also we can't just roll these three meet functions up into the person interface or we're going to lose the specific type information. We would no longer know if person were a mailman, a groomer, or Santa. So even though the zigzagging makes the function calls look unnecessary, it's actually needed to achieve the effect that we want. And the good news is that we don't need to simulate double dispatch this way in Kotlin because we can solve the same problem that it solves much more easily with a few of Kotlin's language features. So the goal of double dispatch is to be able to choose the right function to invoke based on the runtime type of both the receiver and the argument. And we can achieve the same thing by using Kotlin's sealed types with some simple when expressions. So let's rewind our zigzagging code back to what we started with at the beginning of this video. And we'll replace our Schnauzer and Aussie function overloads with a single implementation each, and inside those implementations, we'll use a when expression with an is check. And with this change, we'll notice that we've got some compiler errors on the when expressions telling us that we need to be exhaustive. And one way to be exhaustive is to use an else case. But instead of doing that, let's change the person interface so that it's a sealed interface. And that way, uh, our when expressions can know when we've been exhaustive. So that's an easy change. Let's just use the sealed modifier right here. And now when we run this, we'll get the output that we expect. So this is way less boilerplate than the traditional way that double dispatch is simulated in single dispatch languages. And I don't know about for you, but for me, it's just way easier to read this code. And because we're using sealed types, if we ever were to introduce a new person type, but forget to add it to these when expressions, we'll get a very helpful compiler error to let us know. So that's a look at what double dispatch is how it's been traditionally simulated in a lot of object-oriented languages, 
and how Kotlin solves that same problem with a lot less code and cognitive overhead. So to keep things easy to understand in this video, we used the example type hierarchies of dogs and people. But as we're going to see in the next video, the visitor pattern is essentially just double dispatch applied to type hierarchies of operations and data, plus a little bit of iteration over collections. So now that we've seen how much more gracefully we can achieve the effects of double dispatch in Kotlin, we're going to be well prepared to approach the visitor pattern in the next video. Now, before we wrap up today's video, I'm excited to announce that my book Kotlin and Illustrated Guide is now available in print for the first time ever. In fact, because you all gave it such a warm reception, we saw the book hit number one new release in a number of programming categories on Amazon during its launch week. Thank you so much for that. For those who do buy the paperback during launch month between now and the end of April, we're also working on some bonus digital downloads for you. So if you pick it up this month, be sure to let me know about it at bonus.typealias.com. Well, that's going to do it for today's video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, and I'll see you next time.